Hi everyone, welcome to this quick video about the concept of consent in relation to research ethics. My name is Angela Ballantyne. Today I'm going to give you an introduction to the idea of consent and why it's important in relation to research. Today we're going to talk about consent from an ethical perspective. So I'm not going to be able to speak to you about the specific laws, regulation or policy in your jurisdiction or country or state in relation to what you need to do to get consent from your research participants. So today's a broad, high-level discussion of consent, why it's important, um, what we need to have to get consent, and that will hopefully give you a better understanding of the specific uh, rules and regulations in your jurisdiction. So today we'll talk about the purpose of consent, why we do it, what we need to have valid consent, some challenges to getting consent, and at the end we'll finish with some examples of where it's sometimes ethically permissible to do research without consent. So the purpose of informed consent is really to demonstrate respect for persons, respect for your participants' autonomy, and to give potential participants the opportunity to assess the risks and the potential benefits of research for themselves. To take one example, we can look at the Belmont Report, uh, produced in 1978, just a few months before I was born. So I always remember that. Uh, and this is in the United States. And they define the three key ethical principles of research as respect for persons, justice, and beneficence, which means uh, that research should generate benefits, social benefits for the community. So informed consent relates to this first principle, respect for persons. Valid informed consent requires three things. It's not just enough to get consent, um, to get a signature on a piece of paper. That might mean that it looks like you have informed consent, but it won't necessarily qualify as valid consent. Valid consent requires that your participant has capacity to make that decision themselves, that they understand the research, and that they're acting voluntarily. So capacity is the ability to make decisions, and it's decision specific. So sometimes someone might not have capacity to make a medical decision or a decision to participate in research if that research is really risky, but they might still retain capacity to make decisions about low-risk research, for example, filling in a questionnaire, um, donating blood, for example. So it's important to understand that capacity is decision-specific rather than kind of a global assessment. Capacity means that the research participant uh, can understand the nature of the research, understand the sort of decision they're being asked to make. Importantly, to understand the consequences of participating or not participating in the research, that they're able to communicate their wishes and their concerns, and that they can reason, they can act rationally. So the first requirement is that the potential participant has capacity to make that decision about research participation. The next requirement is that the participant has adequate understanding. Now, in some regulations, you might see this described as disclosure. Disclosure refers to the obligation on the researcher to explain relevant material about the research, but disclosure alone isn't enough. So really the focus is on the participant and whether the participant has adequate understanding of the nature of the research and the consequences, for example. And the third requirement is that the person is acting voluntarily. They're not being manipulated, they're not under any pressure to participate. And we'll talk a little bit more um, in the rest of this talk about some challenges to that requirement of voluntariness. This is what you need for valid consent. Okay, challenges. So I'll just run you through three particular challenges to informed consent and research. The first is the therapeutic misconception. This is where research participants misunderstand the purpose of research and mistakenly believe that they're participating in an activity that, has that is designed to have therapeutic benefit for them to be in their interests. So this really comes down to the distinction between clinical care and clinical research. Clinical care is primarily motivated by the best interests of the patient. The health system is designed to try and make patients better, to improve their health and their welfare. Clinical research, on the other hand, is designed to generate generalizable knowledge that will improve the medical care and the welfare of future generations. So the therapeutic misconception happens when researchers, research participants don't understand 
that the point of the research is to generate knowledge for future patients rather than to offer them specific benefit. And this can occur um, particularly when research is integrated into clinical care. So for example, in oncology, uh, it's you know, very common to have a research study integrated into the delivery of clinical care. So part of the informed consent process is to really try and clarify for participants which, part, which activities that they will engage in are part of their routine clinical care and which um, elements are part of research and to explain that the research elements may benefit them, incidentally. You know, we hope that um, patients will derive some benefit from participating in research sometimes, but that's not the intent. The intent is to generate knowledge. That's the therapeutic misconception. The second potential challenge is coercion. So this relates to the criteria that valid informed consent must be voluntarily offered. Now, obviously, you know, researchers aren't gonna come up and shake the collars of potential participants and force them to participate in research. But there's a concern that participants might feel coerced or might perceive coercion. And this can happen uh, again if research is kind of integrated into their clinical care. But patients in particular are often um, vulnerable in that circumstance and acutely aware of the power differential between themselves and their doctor or their clinical team. And if their doctor or uh, consultant has asked them or invited them to participate in research, they might feel under an obligation to please the doctor uh, and thereby, and that might motivate them to participate. And they might do that because they feel that if they don't participate, they will get a lower standard of clinical care. Even if this is not the case, um, it might be a motivation in the, in the potential participant's mind. So coercion is a threat to make someone worse off or to harm them in order to motivate them to do something. So here, if the patient uh, perceives that they will receive a lower standard of care, that they will be harmed or neglected by their um, doctor if they don't participate in research, this could be a form of coercion that is undermining the voluntariness of their decision. That's why in some cases, it's a requirement the IRB, uh, the Institutional Review Board, might require that an independent research nurse invites the participant to the patient to participate in research so that there's a degree of independence and separation between the clinical care and the research process. So you might have heard of undue inducement. Um, after a little bit of a warning or, or caveat here, I think the issue of undue inducement in research regulations generally is quite confused. It was also, I think, quite confused in the literature, although not in the last few years. There's been some really great work um, coming out, particularly scholars in the United States, really trying to clarify what the concern is in relation to undue inducement. But that academic work, I think, has often not yet had an influence on research regulation. So this is, so the issue of undue inducement, I think, is a, is a confusing one. The first thing to note is the difference between inducements on the one hand and undue inducements on the other. Inducement, inducements generally should be fine. So sometimes we uh, compensate participants for their time or their, the risk they've undertaken to participate in research. And often, you know, higher levels of compensation are often found in research that recruits healthy volunteers, sometimes thousands of dollars to participate in studies. And that inducement has an influence on potential participants' decision-making, just as the pay that I receive from coming to work has an influence on my decision-making around the kind of activities that I'll perform in my work. So inducements, um, sometimes referred to as compensation, are generally fine. The concern, the potential concern, is undue inducements. And this is defined as an offer of money or compensation or um, something valuable that is so high that it undermines the potential participant's ability to reason rationally about the risks and benefits of research. It essentially, it's so much money, it blinds them. Uh, now, there's not a lot of um, empirical research on undue inducements, and that which does exist is quite conflictual. Um, there's certainly not good evidence that this is in fact what happens when you offer people a lot of money to participate in research. Some research suggests that offering participants money is actually a signal to the participants that the research is riskier 
and might make them pay more attention to the risks in research uh, because people, you know, intuitively associate getting high uh, compensation or you know high amount of money with a more risky activity. We're generally not paid to do things that um, are for our own benefit, for example. So the empirical literature on undue inducements, I think, is quite unclear. And it's important to note that um, undue inducements, the concern about undue inducement needs to be weighed up against the concern about not paying people a fair amount for the burdens that they have undertaken. And particularly when we're recruiting healthy volunteers who are participating in research to generate knowledge that will benefit you know, the entire community, it's important that they are fairly compensated for the risks that they undertake. So that's the definition of what undue inducements are. And you know, you can kind of sense my skepticism about um, how much of a threat they are in practice. But certainly, you know, IRBs, uh, research ethics committees, do tend to take um, concern about undue inducement really seriously. And that's because it's thought to be a potential challenge to consent, and consent's really important in research. Okay, so we'll finish by, just by looking at a few cases where in some jurisdictions, um, it's ethical to do research without consent. And I'll run you through three different examples. So first of all, deception. Now, I've talked about why consent is so important. So you might be thinking, how could it ever be ethical to do deceptive research, which is a great question. So research with deception um, might be allowed under the following circumstances. If the research has really high social value, it answers an important question for the community. If it would be impossible to do the research without deceiving participants. If the research is relatively minimal risk, and typically there's a requirement that uh, following the research, there is some sort of debriefing process to explain to participants why deception was necessary. So deception is, for example, really common in uh, research in psychology where often it would sort of undermine the whole point of the study if you explain to people why you were doing it in the first place, because research in psychology is often trying to explore people's reasoning, maybe their unconscious biases, their sort of intuitive um, responses to situations. And if you tell them what you're looking for, that can change their behavior, thereby undermining the point of the study in the first place. So lots of research in psychology um, will either deceive or um, sort of fail to explain to participants what the primary purpose of the study is, but will involve a debriefing process afterwards. This is a really interesting study that was conducted in Singapore, published in 2012, looking at uh, behavior amongst sex workers in working in the foreign entertainment industry in Singapore. So these are sex workers who are working illegally outside the government regulated um, brothels in Singapore. And so obviously a vulnerable group and a group that's hard to engage. The researchers tried various methodologies, including going into karaoke bars and discos and nightclubs and trying to um, recruit foreign workers to interview them about uh, their sex work and particularly condom use and how often they were, if at all, what they were having um, checks for sexually transmitted infections. That didn't work very well. Um, participants uh, were very wary of the researchers and, and not keen to engage. They tried an alternative methodology, which was to send teams in pretending to be clients uh, at the nightclub and interested in purchasing sex work. And they were that way, in that manner able to interview the woman um, and ask them, for example, about their condom use. So this is a quite, I think, kind of interesting and controversial use of deception and research. Um, there wasn't a debriefing process at the end. However, the research methodology was designed, at least in collab collaboration to some degree, with um, community workers, really with the idea around how they could design the research in a way that um, had the least potential to harm sex workers. And so it was designed um, in part in conjunction with uh, community representatives. This is a good example because this was approved by an IRB in Singapore. It was um, you know, legal to, to do this research, but certainly in other jurisdictions, this degree of deception might not be considered permissible. Okay, consent waivers. So this is where you would apply to a research ethics committee or a IRB to ask for permission to do the research without getting consent 
And we're seeing this increasingly in relation to secondary use of clinical data or biosamples. And this might be in relation to biobanking, big data analytics, precision medicine. Uh, there's an increasing interest in using the information that we have in the health system, for example, in electronic health records, or in um, biosamples that are sitting in a repository um, or sitting in the hospital. Uh, there's an interest in using those resources for research, but often researchers won't think it's practical to go back and get consent from the original patients. And that might be because um, if it's a cancer registry, patients might have died, for example. It might be that the numbers uh, that they're looking at are just so large, you know, maybe it's 500,000 electronic health records or a million health records it would just be impractical, it would be too time consuming to try and track people down and get consent. Another reason is that there might be a concern that um, if they ask for consent, only some subpopulations will opt in. Those might be populations that are more interested in technology and research or have higher trust in researchers, and that might distort the sample that the researchers have access to. So under these circumstances, many jurisdictions um, have an option for applying for approval from a research ethics committee or an IRB to get permission to use the samples without consent. Some of the other requirements that apply here are typically that the research, again, has high social value. It's an important question that needs to be answered, that there's no way of doing the research in a manner that involves getting consent, and I've explained some of the reasons why, and that the research is overall minimal risk. And finally, doing research uh, on patients without capacity. So we spoke earlier about capacity and that capacity to consent was one of the conditions for valid consent. Yet there are a number of patients uh, and populations that lack capacity, and yet it's still really important to generate medical knowledge and understanding for these groups. Uh, so for example, that might include older adults that lack capacity. This is an example, this study is of adults who have um, experienced cardiac arrest and are therefore in the middle of a health emergency and aren't in a position to be able to participate in a participant information sheet and consent process. And yet it's still important to generate um, medical knowledge and to answer important questions about the clinical care of these populations. This is a study that was conducted in the UK uh, a few years ago, and it was trialing the use of adrenaline in ambulances in response to cardiac arrest. It was a randomized double-blind uh, placebo-controlled trial. Use of adrenaline was standard procedure uh, but there was concerns that that might in fact be causing long-term harm to patients, even if it provided a short-term benefit in terms of um, ensuring short-term survival. And so the study involved introducing a saline placebo for 50% of patients. Uh, the information process for the community involved community ads on radio, um, advertising, and the option for people to opt out if they wanted. So if people felt very strongly about the study and had heard about it and thought they were at high risk of cardiac arrest, they could order a bracelet and wear that bracelet for the entire duration of the study. And then if they did have a cardiac arrest um, and when the paramedics arrived, they would not include them in the study. So again, quite a controversial uh, study, certainly had some community um, pushback uh, in this area, but a really interesting example or again, of a study that was approved to be conducted in the absence of consent. So in summary, we've talked about the purpose of consent that's really focused on demonstrating respect for persons, respect for autonomy, and ensuring that participants have the opportunity to assess the risks and benefits of research themselves. We've talked about the requirements for valid consent, that's capacity, understanding, and voluntariness. We've talked about some challenges to consent, including the therapeutic misconception, uh, perceptions of coercion and undue inducement. And we've talked about a few examples of where you might get ethical approval to do research without consent, including deception, consent waivers, and uh, research with patients without capacity. Thanks so much. I hope you found this useful.